Thanks very much indeed, Jim. Our third speaker this evening is Philip Orr. Philip Orr is a former teacher, a consultant to various museums today, um, an author and a playwright. He's best known, I think, for his 1987 book from Blackstaff Press, The Road to the Somme, which Keith referred to, which captures the kind of atmosphere and kind of motivation of the uh, UVF men and indeed Ulster farmers and city workers who joined uh, the 36th Ulster Division. More recently, uh, Philip has produced a play looking back at the third home rule crisis and the Ulster Covenant, uh, which I've seen produced and I know is attracting great interest at every level. And he's also published a new book called New Perspectives, Politics, Religion and Conflict in mid antrim 1911 to 1914, which is a study really of the Ballymena area uh, and the Great War. I'd ask you to show your appreciation for Mr. Philip Orr. Um, thanks very much, Eamon. The death of the men of the 36th Ulster Division on and just after the 1st of July 1916 was ready-made for political symbolism in the new Northern Ireland that emerged in the aftermath of the Great War. The sudden destruction of so many young men from all across Ulster on an ironically sunny day on the bloody anniversary of the original date of the Battle of the Boyne was bound to be a potent emblem of Protestant loyalty, especially given the contrasting and powerful image of the rebellion launched by Pierce and Connolly in the very same year, which became a founding story for the Free State. It was also an act of reassurance to Britain that though the UVF might have been preparing to launch a coup d'etat during the Home Rule crisis, its members were, at heart, loyal to the empire from which they had feared Home Rule would sever them. In the wartime months after the Somme and the post-war years and decades, First of July ceremonies came to have a memorial significance comparable to the annual Remembrance Day services in November. Orange Lodges held the 36th Division and its military heroes in regular remembrance. Streets and military barracks were named for the battlefields where Ulster men had died. And in France, the Ulster Tower was built, the Western Front's first enduring memorial situated on the location of the tragedy. To a large degree, this emphasis on the 1st of July at the Somme occluded other military history and other deaths, both in the Ulster Division at other battles and by the many Irish servicemen from all political and religious backgrounds that has already been referred to. The urgent need to generate a powerful founding story for a Northern Ireland that Irish unionism had never expressly intended to create back in the pre-war years was important. Northern Ireland lacked some of the intense cultural underpinning of the long Irish national project with its centuries-long array of heroes and martyrs. The dead of the Somme could fill some of that gap. And Northern Ireland, newly prized from its nine-county host province, suddenly had to assert its geopolitical identity, create its new territoriality and homogeneity, and do so on the hoof, if you like. The narrative of an Ulster division which embodied northernness suited that task. It is interesting to look at the Battle of Gallipoli and to note, uh, to a lesser degree, Vimy Ridge, which for Australia and Canada created founding stories for what had been hitherto rather large and uncoordinated imperial territories. These founding stories were about armies that had given an opportunity for people to witness a coherence to the national narrative joined up together in uniform, wearing the same badges. These, of course, were narratives that would also be about growing autonomy for Australia and Canada from London. 
The psalm was an important indicator of a new identity, and looking back to the day in 1915 when the entire Ulster Division marched past the City Hall on its way to the trenches, Ulster Unionists would have sensed embodied within the ranks of that long column of men the very essence of the incipient Northern Ireland. Regional battalion by regional battalion, county by county, street by street. Albeit that men from Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal would soon be left outside that new identity. This is in contrast then to a rather different constellation of meanings for the psalm for Britain as a whole, in which we see threads of such things as a sense of lambs to the slaughter, military incompetence, naivety and failure, perhaps military and imperial decline for Britain, a whole range of meanings that the psalm came to have. Now, of course, more recently, revisionist historians have indicated that perhaps the Somme was a significant battle for defeating the German army in its pride and pomp, albeit at some cost. But for Ulster, the 36th Division was also about heroism and, to a degree, a success story. The 36th, after all, had advanced fleetingly further than almost all other British units at the Somme on the 1st of July. And a discourse emerged in Northern Ireland in which this was seen as proof of the good training the men had had in the UVF, their innate bravery and skill. For a Northern Ireland state still nervous and uncertain about its own internal volatility and wary of both its southern neighbor and indeed its English master, these were important qualities to memorialize and to valorize. It might have been expected, however, that with time's passage, the death of a generation of veterans and the arrival of new conflicts, both global and on the streets here in Northern Ireland, that 70 years later, say, the culture of the Ulster Somme experience would gradually have been fading away. And indeed, that's what I thought I saw when I began my research with the last few veterans in the mid or early 1980s for my book, already mentioned, published in 87. No publication of any real significance on the topic had happened for six and a half decades. And when I visited local military museums, photos and diaries lay under dust. When I visited the Ulster Tower at Thiefel, I had to hunt down a key in a nearby French village It was little visited and empty. I was aware that the Orange Order still retained a deep interest in the subject and that the modern day UVF, when in jail, had named their huts prior to the H-Block era after 36th Divisional battles. And there were, I thought, one or two murals on the Shankill. Indeed, there were some academics who were beginning to do interesting work on the topic and, and I knew of the the Farset project, which was beginning the process of thinking about renovating the tower. But, by and large, compared with today, things were quiet. Things are different now. In the space of 30 years, the Ulster Tower has been redeveloped and hosts literally tens of thousands of visitors every year. The nearby Thiepfel Wood has been bought, preserved and excavated. An Ulster Somme Heritage Centre has thrived. School groups, adult groups visit it and also travel to France and Flanders. Scores of publications about the impact of the Somme and the Great War as a whole on local communities and different facets of the Great War military history of Ulster have been published. The modern day UVF has, as a conflict resolution strategy, created Somme associations focused on the battle as a keystone of Ulster pride. Murals about the Ulster Division adorn many, many walls. Of course, this exponential growth must be interwoven with the widespread growth of other things like trenches tourism overall in Western Europe, the availability of cheap flights to France and Flanders, the growth of internet fora for great war buffs to discuss their interests, 
and the explosion of an interest in genealogy and family history now that such research has become easier to undertake. There's also the growth of interest in Ireland as a whole in a war that involved service, as we have heard, by over 200,000 Irishmen, the island's most pervasive military experience of the 20th century, and yet which was a taboo subject, as we have heard, for so long for nationalists and republicans, until the peace process and growing Irish self-confidence, perhaps, allowed Irish people to investigate the complex Irish careers of their ancestors. But I would suggest that there is a strongly unionist component to this growth of interest in the last three decades in the Somme and the Great War. As 1690 recedes further from modern British memory, the glorious revolution of the Williamite era is little known, treasured, or understood in Britain's public memory. Celebration of the glorious revolution in its Irish dimension rings no bells on the mainland. The wigs and stallions and swords of the 17th century are antique as visual emblems for unionism. However, the fact is that Remembrance Day, focused on two world wars plus, is Britain's greatest communal get-together, its single most extensive and binding ritual from Shetland to Cornwall. And taking part in it is a very affirming thing for the Britishness of Unionists and Loyalists, for whom so much has been whittled away, they feel, of their distinctive heritage in Ireland. Northern Ireland at every level was once about Unionist hegemony in Parliament at Stormont, council chambers, judiciary, police. Some commemoration on poppy wearing that accompanies it is an indicator as it was perhaps in the insecure days after the Government of Ireland Act of an irreducible element of Britishness. Also for many loyalist communities within the Unionist family, participation in some commemorative culture and regular visits to the battlefields are very important in linking loyalism to a bigger story. When loyalists walk to the Menin Gate, or stand at the fateful memorial to the missing, or indeed visit the Island Bridge War Memorial in Dublin. They rid themselves of the taint so often put upon them by commentators who see them as specifically sectarian, a taint that Republican activists have so often easily persuaded the world does not cling to them with post-colonial talk of national liberation struggles and inclusive goals. The visit to the Western Front that many loyalists make, and many do, sometimes several times a year, affords their history tragic dignity, places it in a cosmopolitan context rather than the insular box of Northern Ireland disputation. It offers a glimpse of codes of honour to young men cast aside in a post-industrial no-man's land. What has also been important is the need for a people's history and loyalism, which the recent saga of the Somme culture has generated. Whereas many working class Protestants found history classes in school disillusioning, with all the emphasis on Julius Caesar, Henry V, and 1066, the Somme narrative of the Ulster Division at Thiefal has been one which involves their family, their street, their social class, and as agents in historical processes, albeit tragic ones. So what of the future? I believe that some commemoration will continue to be important to Ulster Unionists and Loyalists as a ritual that reaffirms Britishness, and that whilst other more inclusive or experimental rituals may be created and will be and should be, the old rituals with their military flavour will still flourish, for reasons I hope will be apparent from what I've just said. But what I do believe is that as this society becomes more peaceful and stable, and we all hope it does in the years ahead, that licence to experiment with memory will be extended. It seems to me that one such experiment during the years ahead will be with horizontal history, as the historian Timothy Snyder terms it. 
Horizontal history is where you look at what was happening elsewhere at the same time in other places. In tonight's case, what was the experience of the Great War in other countries, other regions? Such knowledge may help us to gain perspectives on what we underwent and did or did not do in that, on our part of the world. For a start, during the Great War in many parts of Europe, ordinary men were conscripted into the armies of the combatant countries. Some, such as the Macedonians, found themselves fighting in rival armies because at the Treaty of London in 1912, their territory had been gobbled up by the expansionist dreams of Bulgaria, Greece, and Serbia. Not incomparable to that of the Poles, whose national territory, if you like, had been divided up amongst Austro-Hungarian, German, and Russian empires, and found themselves fighting one another, if you like, across an Eastern European no man's land. None of that experience happened in Ireland, despite Roger Casement's desire to create German soldiers, if you like, or pro-German soldiers, out of the prisoner of war camps where Irish men were held. And no Irishman was ever conscripted in Ireland to the British Army. Secondly, some, um, some countries such as Macedonia and Serbia, and parts of northern France and southern Belgium, had their homeland occupied by invading armies, infrastructure devastated, civilians killed, or in the case of the Balkans, ethnically cleansed, as many men in the 10th Division witnessed. In Germany, tens of thousands died due to starvation and disease caused by the Allied naval blockade. No such fate befell Ireland, where the only civilian losses, and there were several, of course, were occasioned by the Easter Rising or occasioned by, those, uh, by, by the submarine campaign of the Germans and was seen an example with the Lusitania. In fact, during the war, some Irish people experienced prosperity as cash flowed through the economy. Wages increased, albeit with the gains being eaten up by inflation in later stages and hardship brought about by final um, food shortages and rationing. Thirdly and finally, as for Ireland's casualty rate, although thousands of Irish men did die, and as Keith has pointed out, the recruitment rate proportionally was remarkably high. And though each death was a tragedy, compared with the casualty rate in some other countries, this country could be said to have got off lightly. 16% of the population of Serbia is thought to have perished. This figure, if it were to be transferred proportionally to the Irish population, would have resulted in the deaths of 280,000 Irish people, rather than the figure offered to you quite rightly earlier for the Irish casualty rate. So all in all, horizontal history of the Great War might teach us one or two interesting things. In this case, perhaps, that whilst we had four years of tragedy and hardship in many, many ways. We also have perhaps inherited a less complicated, less destructive heritage from that war than some places did. I would hope that doing such horizontal learning, not just for the Great War period, but throughout the entire decade that we are remembering collectively may well become significant. It may just teach all of us unionist, nationalist, and other new lessons offer new perspectives on ourselves and make the boundary between our experience and the lives of others even more permeable, even more porous. Thank you.